For many people, our winter activities don't just define our time spent outdoors, but they create a larger community we are a part of. For skiers, we relate by where we first learned to ski, as well as where we have shared many fond memories with our friends and family. Bolton Valley, a quick drive from Burlington, Vermont, has made lasting impressions on locals and visitors for nearly 100 years. It's just a wonderful woods to know that it's available to ski in at any time. It's an incredible piece of property that is still pretty wild. You ski for a few minutes and you feel like you're out there. I've been coming up here on and off for years, so I just come. I don't think about it, really. Probably skiing started back here in the 1920s and people want to continue to keep it that special place it really is. The Bolton backcountry has a rich history and took the work of many people to realize what it is today. The beginning of this legacy starts with Ed Bryant, a forester born in 1883. After serving in World War I, Bryant returned to Bolton and purchased 4,400 acres for $24,000 in 1922. His idea was to actually build a ski area up here. He was one of the founders of skiing in Vermont. Nordic skiing or downhill skiing, it was one of the same at that time. It was leather strap bindings at that time. Bryant was a ski advocate. He cut trails including Snow Hole, North Slope, and Heavenly Highway in the 20s and encouraged friends and locals to ski the area. He had these three cabins that people could stay in as they hiked up because there was no access road up here. And we would get the key from uh, Ed Bryant, who lived at the bottom of the mountain. We used to hike up the logging road. And the logging road went all the way up to, to, uh, to Bryant's camp. So we'd ski all the way up to Bryant's camp. We went up the Heavenly Highway about once or twice in all those years because it was so tiring getting that far up the road, so it was a lot of work, but skiing was good. Bryant died in the early 1950s, and with the stipulation to leave the spruce, he sold it to Plant and Griffith Lumber Company in Jonesville. The land was primarily used for logging until 1966, when owners Ralph and Roland Delorier began development of Bolton Valley Resort. There really wasn't many Nordic centers when this was started. My brother-in-law, Bob Stone, was the UVM ski coach. They had the idea of coming up here and building a Nordic center, and he really started it. And Gardner went down and, and worked there when Bob left and really expanded it. I met Gardner in the probably 1982, 83 skiing up here. And you know, it was the old Nordic center, which is now Mountain Ops. And so he ran the Nordic center and he ran it for probably 20, 25 years. And he wasn't like the high level skier, but he just loved to ski and he loved the land and he liked people enjoying it. So he took what Mr. Bryant had done for trails and he incredibly expanded them. And you know, he'd get these young guys in there working in the Nordic Center. These guys love to ski, so they wanted to ski the trails. So he was like, let's build some more trails. So, you know, it was private land back then. So it was Gardner's playground, you know, and it became our playground. In the 70s, I was working for the Regional Planning Commission and making maps in the way that you have a piece of mylar and a pen. Gardner needed maps to show the trails of the Nordic area. He had someone take just a topographic map and lay out the lines of where the trails probably are. And then I took them back to the Regional Planning Office and would make those maps. So the earliest maps were those that came out of <laughs> off my pen. Then we would gradually add additional ones. Gardner's Lane, for example, was a trail that he had suggested and it was cut, but it didn't have a name. And I credit myself for having said, well, let's call it Gardner's Lane. Gardner Lane finally had a trail name for him, which I thought was appropriate. And then eventually with that map that I had been making by hand and it had been reproduced and so on, someone went out with a GPS box on his head 
and walked the trails and came up with quite a different map. Yeah. Besides Gardner Lane's young trail crews, the trails were also maintained by a group of longtime Bolton skiers called the Old Goats. Membership varied, but some local constants included Gardner Lane, Clem and Sylvia Holden, Olga Verana, and Howard Bacon. It just evolved. I have no idea how we, how we started. We just sort of carried an axe with us. And do tell marks on the Telmark Hill and only make one or two nice tracks down and then everybody coming up the mountain could see what good skiers were there. So that was Clem's Tele Show Off. That, that was the place. Every once in a while we'd fall and mess it all up. It was very nearby and it was a wonderful place to come to be to by ourselves. There was the legendary Olga of Verena who, uh, for whom the Olga's Falls is named. And she said to me recently, she's 95, and, and she said it was the best time of her life when she was doing the trail clearing and making bridges and uh, cutting down trees and clipping, that that was the time of her life. And I agree, it was a wonderful time and Gardner was never without a project. We just finished one trail and he, we got an idea, let's do something else. One year, the downhill area was completely closed. Well, as far as we were concerned, Bolton was never closed because Gardner had a key. The town agreed to plow up, and they plowed our little parking lot down for the cross-country people. They did it on their own, thanks to Gardner's goodwill. Over the years, the area's popularity continued to grow. In February of 2011, it was announced that 1,100 acres of woods, glades, and trails would be sold to a local timber company, ending public use on the land. With an instant outpouring of support, locals formed the Friends of Bolton Nordic and Backcountry to protect the land and the public's access to it. You know, we just said, this can't happen. Could we get people on board to do this? And it happened. You know, we, we took a year to negotiate everything another year to fundraise $1.85 million, and then another year to finalize contract. That was 2013 that we finalized everything, and uh, we haven't looked back. As Bolton celebrates its 50th anniversary, it's a fitting time to recognize both the work that has gone into conserving the backcountry, along with our excitement for the next adventure in these magical woods. The slopes of Bolton Valley have been skied since Ed Bryant cut the first backcountry trails in the late 20s. But it wasn't until 1966 that the Bolton Valley Resort that we know was started. Hi, I'm Ralph Delorier, President of Bolton Valley. We have a special offer for our Vermont friends. You can ski all day every Tuesday and Thursday for only $10, half day for $8. We hope you come up and join us soon. Hey Dad, you want to race? Sure do, Adam. Let's go. Over the last 50 years, Bolton Valley has become a loved family ski area, but the details of what it took to create might surprise you. The National Guard at the time, and regulations weren't quite as stringent, so I uh, borrowed a National Guard helicopter and flew over the property a few times and looked at the terrain and, and decided, okay, I thought this maybe could be a ski area. so. All it was was a logging road, because there really was no interest to the property. And so I went to Burlington Savings Bank, the biggest bank of the state. At the time, it was, I guess, a million dollars to build a whole thing. That was a lot of money then. But the whole thing is, they said they'd lend me the money, providing the state built the access road. In the original master plan, the access road was designed to be a four-mile-long, undeveloped road through the wilderness that arrives at a slopeside alpine village. I went to the state and lobbied in the legislature for the access road, and they said, I said, listen, you put this up, we're gonna provide all these jobs, and they started to cut the first tree for the access road, May 1st. Paved it October 20th. And believe me, it was a design-build project. It was amazing, I said, why is this road being built to nowhere? 
1966, I was working for the then from one Department of Highways, and I was in charge of the compaction inspection through the Soils Engineering Division. The road's tough because it's at quite a grade. You're coming from 500 foot elevation down at the bottom of the hill to uh, 2200 at the base. The year before I had the money, I went in. We improved the access road so we could drive trucks up on it. I was pretty confident, I guess we we're gonna do it. And uh, cut the lift line for the, uh, the long lift over here, lift number one, which is wilderness, and then the mid-mountain lift and uh, snowflake for the three lifts. And the first year, we built three chairlifts the base lodge, the cafeteria and the restaurant, and the ski shop, and the first 24 hotel rooms, the parking lot, the water system, the sewer system, nine ski trails, and opened on time December 15th. The only problem is there was no snow. I mean, there was really no snow. And uh, the restaurant was open, and in the corner of the restaurant, I think it was the 23rd, um, Father McSweeney, who was the pastor at the local church, came up and was having a beverage. So I sat down with him and I said, well, what you doing? I said, listen, I, got no, I haven't got anybody eating in the dining room tonight. It's pretty cool, pretty quiet. You want to have dinner? So we said, so we sat down by the window facing this direction in the dining room. And of course, he wanted to say a little, little grace before dinner, and he did, and he said, well, we could sure use some snow. And halfway through dinner, it started to snow. And there's no good weather reports. You never knew what was going on in 1960. Next. Believe me, they were just flip of the coin. And it snowed, as I recall, for 54 hours. And we got like four feet of snow. And we opened uh, the day after Christmas in 1966. And then we had a good snow year from that. As you can see, Adam's grown a lot in the last few years, and so has Bolton Valley. We've improved our trails and our snowmaking. So come on up and join the Delorier family at Bolton Valley this winter. Once Bolton Valley was off and running, the mountain's unique focus on family and kids began to take shape. We knew that we didn't have the steeps to be another stow or another sugar bush. And all of their marketing at the time, if you went back to Ski and Skiing Magazine, was always almost to the expert skier and rarely to families. So it was really designed for families. We put in the first nursery that I know of at the base of the mountain, the first year we opened. Husband's father, actually, and mother first picked Bolton Valley 50-odd um, years ago because there was a daycare. That was the reason that they picked the hill initially. Um, so through the years, we've all gone through the, the daycare, so the kind of tradition continues. It's always been a place where uh, parents could bring their, their children and feel comfortable. It had always the feel of a family mountain. And then, of course, you had the ski programs in the schools. As they developed, they came up here. When I went to Burlington High School, it was maybe, at the most, a dozen kids that skied. And this is the largest high school in the state. Vermonters just didn't ski. It was really for the wealthy out-of-staters. So I said, when I start a ski area, I'm going to teach every local kid, not just Bolton, Vermont kid that wants to ski, for nothing. For the first year, I went to different schools and said, if you bring them up on the school bus, we'll give them lifts and lessons one night a week for the whole season for 10 bucks. But we had 43 different schools in our after-school program. And they still have tons of them in their after-school programs. But in the end, we figured that we taught 27,000 local kids to ski. Of all the good things we've done at Bolton, I think uh, that's one of the things that I feel the best about. You know, if I'm out west or uh, somewhere else uh, skiing and I wear my Bolton Valley hat, it's amazing. Um, how many people will come up to you and say, oh, I learned to ski at Bolton Valley. I think that's sort of what Bolton is. It's, it's where a lot of people have learned how to ski. So yeah, I learned to ski at Bolton when I was three years old, 1982, 1983, um, and then was gone for about 20 years. And now we're back, Kaylin is five, and this is her, boy, almost second year, full year. She started on the rope toe and the Mighty Might, and now she goes to the top of the Vista chair. And so we grew up uh, skiing here. Well, we've got 
three generations that are out on the mountain, and I think that's special. <laughs> Over the years, thousands of families have skied together, and many, many people have learned to ski at Bolton Valley. But perhaps none have gone on to as much fame or made as big of an impression as Ralph's own sons, Rob and Eric. Since they're four years old, they ski at least 100 days a year. I mean, they get off the school bus, the Smiley school bus, and we had night skiing, and they go right to the slopes. Every day we were open, and they and they come in for supper at seven o'clock. And I, you know, I remember this big group of kids. Some of those guys were older than us, and some were younger, and uh, they were some really good skiers. And so you're growing up around this group of people that you, in some way, in some cases, idolize and want to ski like them. And but it was kind of inspiring to to sort of be able to be part of that. Our favorite used to be the Vista Chair. We'd spend a lot of time on there. The trail underneath was called Show Off. And that's where the big rock is, and usually the Delores were seen going off of that. So it's almost like you wanted to ride the chair and say, oh, when are they coming down? I, wanted, I hope they do it, Daphne. I hope they do this. But they're pretty amazing kids. You guys set the bar high. We never, ever achieved that bar. <laughs> but uh, It was fun uh, to watch. It, it was fun to watch, and it was fun to try to get better. I remember a couple times them standing at the top, actually on top of the ski hut of Snowflake, and as we were coming up, they, they would stop the chairlift and just pelt us with snowballs. <laughs> so we were kind of uh, stuck in the chairlift getting <laughs> hit with snowballs. But that was sort of what type of place it was. After growing up on Bolton and skiing just about everything, Rob and Eric wanted a change of scenery. They came into my office and said, uh, well, Dad, next year when uh, you open the, the ski area, I, I, we're, we're not going to be here. I said, what do you mean you're not going to be here? I said, I could have sold this place and retired. My, your mother said we had to keep it in the family and you guys were going to run it and now you're telling me you're leaving? And I said, no, nope, we're going to uh, California to be in the movies. I said, well, there's hope for that. I thought to myself, they'll be back next year. They'll, they're never going to be in the darn movies. Next thing you know, they star in this big ski film Extreme One was sponsored by North Face. Three years later, they owned the company. We're traveling all around the world. While Bolton began with a focus on families and kids, there has always been terrain for expert skiers, such as wood skiing. Management took steps in the 1980s by opening up some of this terrain at Timberline, which became Bolton Valley's third peak. Opening of the Timberline area uh, expanded the skiable terrain by probably a third, maybe almost a half. So we had a, a set group that would patrol at Timberline. We didn't have the lodge. We had a, a rental trailer, construction trailer, if you will. That one end had a window to sell tickets. The other end had an overhead garage door that we could bring the patients into as we took care of them. So that's how we started the Timberline business and learned how to patrol from that aspect and try to tie it into the main ski area. Even with more skiable terrain, Bolton Valley started to fall on hard times in the late 1990s, and the mountain was eventually taken over by Mason Dwinell prior to the 97-98 season. But with new ownership came new challenges. The Mason tenure, I don't recall that year even making it to March. Because of the way the place had been parceled up, there were various owners. The sports center was owned by somebody. The base lodge was owned by somebody. The hotel was owned by somebody else. And at that time, they could not get the leases on the base lodge. So in order to accommodate skiers that wanted to ski out of the main base area here, they took hotel rooms in the bottom of the hotel and took the hotel furniture out of it and put benches in there. And that became changing area for um, the, the customers. It was tough on the customers, credit to the customers, they stayed loyal to Bolton Valley, and it was tough on employees. Uh, and then uh, the following year, the Hamiltons bought it out and went great guns, put a lot of bucks into rebuilding the area. And then Bob Priest came in here as a consultant and, and bought the place out. Bob Freeze made many improvements in Bolton Valley, none more lasting than the installation of the Vista Lift. One of the things that I take the most pride in was the, the building of the Vista Lift. And that was quite a challenge. At the time, we didn't have top to bottom lift service. 
you rode mid-mountain lift to the middle of the mountain, and then you get on the old Vista lift and rode that to the top. Uh, we were going 12-hour days from April right up until I think we opened Christmas Day or the day before Christmas. Skiers loved the new top-to-bottom skiing, but running a resort is no small task. Prior to the 2007-2008 season, the mountain ownership shifted to Doug Nettie and Larry Williams. Pretty much grew up skiing at Bolton. My father joined the patrol in, I think, uh, the late 60s. And we skied at Bolton for really as long as he was on the patrol, which I think was eight or nine years. It was a lot of fun. You know, we were just a rat pack all over, all over the mountain and we'd ski all day. And then at the end of the day, we'd get to do a sweep with the patrollers. After sweep, uh, they'd usually retire to a bar either on the mountain or down at the bottom of the mountain. And uh, I think we ate gallons of popcorn and stole sips of beer. What really interests me about Bolton is is, is you know the kind of the joy and happiness it brings to the community. Um, the after school program up there I think is huge. I get a big thrill seeing all these kids get off the bus. And... After we purchased the land and the hotel we started some negotiations with Bob Fries who is the current owner of Bolton Valley. So over a series of maybe two to four years we invested in Bolton as his partner and eventually we invested enough money where we essentially owned Bolton Valley, the resort. Under the new ownership, focus was put squarely on snowmaking, grooming, night skiing, and cultivating a family-friendly culture. We invested a significant amount of money into our snowmaking system in the way of energy-efficient guns. Um, we bought new groomers, and uh, fortunately I've got a couple groomers here that have been here for, since they were in high school. The loyalty of the employees has always struck me, and and I had uh, working for me snowmakers that would do anything to keep going. We used to keep piles of bales of hay and covered with tarps, and it would not be unusual to come up the mountain in the, early in the morning and see smoke rising, and oh, what the hell's going on now? And if they would freeze a pipe, they would stuff bales of hay under it, soak them in fuel and, and thaw them that way. Yeah, it was these guys are, Dedicated, dedicated. What we hear time and time again is just the quality of snow, uh, snow surfaces that we have available here at Bolton Valley. And a lot of that is how we make snow, when we make snow, and what we do and when we groom. Well, you know, one thing, one thing that we've done here at Bolton Valley is taken some of my previous experience and a couple of other folks and apply it to our snowmaking process. Um, you know, we have limited water, and we have limited horsepower to put snow on the hill. So we try to do the best we can with what we have. So we've upgraded our pumps, we've upgraded our equipment, and we make snow you know, at the appropriate time. You can make snow at much warmer temperatures, but the quality of that snow suffers. In April of 2017, the mountain returned to its roots as Ralph Delorier, in conjunction with his family and a small group of local investors, purchased Bolton Valley. Bolton's many unique attributes, from the beauty of Vermont's highest base lodge to the teams of people, past and present, have made Bolton what it is, a place that has and continues to provide lasting community and fond memories. A lot of history here at Bolton Valley and I really, really enjoy it and it's the people. Bolton Valley is about the people and I, I'm not just saying that, I, I, I've seen it and I, and I believe it. There's a great team of people that uh, make Bolton uh, what it is. And I feel very, very good about the core staff that's here at Bolton Valley. Overall, the staff is just phenomenal. They've, they really care about all of us and they treat us extremely well. It's great to be a part of it. It means home. It's home. Yeah. You know, when people say, where do you live? I said, I live on Bolton. It's still about sort of families and kids. I mean, even today, you know, you can drop your kid off and let him run all over the mountain and really not worry about him. And it was very, you know, that's really the same at what, as it was back in the 70s. Yeah. Up here with friends and family, it's still, that's what it's about here and it's yeah. just fun to be with everybody. Okay, that's enough for us to go see Bolton. Yeah.
Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.